Thanks everyone for coming. I don't know, I lost, track, I lost track of what number of meetup this is for the group, but it's been growing really nicely and we're happy to be at Spotify. Um, they have an amazing space as you can see um, and it's really good of them to host us. Our very first speaker from the data engineering group was a Spotify employee. So in a sense, we're kind of coming back home even though the first group wasn't here. But um, I, always, I always point out Eric. I love to make fun of Eric. Eric like started this whole thing off, so Eric's here. Um, cool, so we wanted to, uh, I'm gonna introduce Josh from Chartbeat in a minute. However, before I do that, I wanted to tell you that we're playing we're, we're holding a really interesting experiment tonight. I'm the founder of Hacka Labs, and I had this crazy idea that we can beat Hacker News. Now we're Hakka, H-A-K-K-A, -K -K -A, they're Hacker. Um, we're Labs, they're News, they're .com, actually they, they don't have HackerNews.com, we're .co. Um, so this is our site, H-A-K-K-A -K -K -A .co, for those of you who haven't seen it. And we launched our very, very, minimally, horribly minimally viable, barely viable comments feature this week. Um, it doesn't look like much, but we have a feeling that we can engage a really high-end, um, high-quality network of engineers. So um, tonight, this is actually a, a blurb. This is a landing page on the site. Um, you'll find it on the homepage for Josh's talk. And we'll be posting the video of the talk there in the next couple days. But here's the thing. If you want to ask Josh a question tonight, you have to do it on the site in our MVP comments feature, which means you're going to have to OAuth in through GitHub, which means you have to have GitHub. But get, this, all, this all should work on your mobile device, by the way. I've done it, and the OAuth experience is not bad. So um, we need your feedback. We need your help. Um, we want to see your comments in the form of questions on the site. And um, when Josh is done, I'm going to come up here and read comments off the site um, and those are going to be the questions. So if, if you just play along, like I'd really, I'd really love it. <laughs> I'll be your friend forever. Um, yeah, so that's the site. So you can check that out and uh, feel free to let us know what you think. So I'm going to introduce Josh Schwartz, who is a, a data scientist at Chartbeat. He's been there a couple years. Um, before that, he did some pretty interesting stuff, including MIT, a stint in academia, coffee roasting in San Francisco, and then he decided to come back to the real world, um, and now he's a data engineer slash uh, scientist at Chartbeat. So he has a really interesting talk lined up. I've been looking forward to this for a long, for a long time. Um, so I hope that you'll give him a warm uh, round of applause and uh, your undivided attention. Thanks, Josh. Take it away. All right, is this on, hopefully? All right. Um, well, thanks very much for having me. I was going to uh, to open with saying that you guys should feel free to interrupt me. I guess you should feel free to interrupt me via GitHub. But uh, but anyway, I'd love I'd love this to be as interactive as possible. So if pe if people do have questions through whatever medium we should go through, um, definitely um, jump in. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Um, All right, um, so the plan for today is to talk through basically the entire kind of data pipeline that we've built at Chartbeat. So we're going to talk through, start with uh, the real-time system that we kind of was our first core piece of infrastructure, um, talk through how that works, what sort of data uh, is, is coming through it, um, move on to a historical pipeline which we've bolted on over the last couple of years, and finally sort of finish off with a really neat application of that pipeline, which is basically s s some work that, that uh, some folks from my team have done on generating he uh, human readable text uh, using this historical data store. Um, before I jump into that though, you know, whenever I'm putting together a talk, um, I like to sort of try to figure out, you know, why the hell would anybody actually listen to this, right? Um, and, and I think maybe there are three things that, that I might phrase as, you know, r things you might get out of this. So, so first of all, um, we've built a pipeline which just handles a lot of data. So we handle at, you know, at our most extreme peaks, something like 250,000 plus requests per second. Um, day to day, we're handling over 200,000 requests a second. So it's just a, it's just a pipeline which handles a lot of data, which might be interesting if you're a person who's also building stuff that handles a lot of data. Um, we've also um, 
built this uh, data warehouse over the last couple of years, and I'd say that, that it, the building the warehouse has not been easy. Um, and we've learned a lot of lessons, and we've learned them the hard way, and I think that hopefully some things I have to say might save you some time in, in building things in the future. Um, and, and finally, uh, there might be some neat applications. I think the language stuff is pretty cool. And, and one of the kind of central tenets of, of what I have to say is that, you know, a lot of the, the I'm not going to show you any fancy math or really sophisticated machine learning or anything like that. The point is that once you've got a good pipeline in place that lets you sort of do queries quickly, it's often not that hard, at least in our experience, to put on really cool products on top of it. So, so may, you know, maybe you'll find, find some inspiration there. Um, so with that said, uh, let me jump in. Um, so first of all, for those who don't know, um, Chartbeat uh, is a company that's been around for about five and a half years. We're based entirely in New York. We're in Union Square. We've got around 70 employees, and the split is something like 50% engineering and 50% you know, business and whatnot. Um, and traditionally, uh, the thing that we were known for was real-time analytics on websites. So the idea is we talk about the state of a site um, in kind of a second by second way. So we think about a site as sort of a state machine where you know, at any given moment you can capture, okay, where are the people on the site? Where, who are the people? Where do they come from? Where are they going and all that? Um, and this end, ended up becoming a really powerful tool for people in the media industry. Um, you know, the, the, the way that I tend to phrase this is, it, you know, if you think about an editor at, you know, your favorite, you know, daily newspaper, right? That person essentially has an infinite supply of content and a very finite number of places that they can be promoting that content. So you can only post so many things to Twitter a day. You can only have so many things on your homepage so on and so on. And so you kind of have, have an infinite number of decisions you could make at any given second, um, and you need some data to help to s support that decision-making apparatus, and, and we ended up filling in that role. So to, to show you an example of what a Chartbeat dashboard that a person's using day-to-day -day looks like, um, it, it's something like this. So, so here I'm showing uh, data from gizmodo.com, who's nice enough to let us demo their stuff. Um, so what we see here is that there are 20,520 people on Gizmodo at the second that I took this screenshot. Um, there are 4,171 people on the homepage, 1,049 on this article, and so on and so on. 2,414 people are coming from email apps and IM, and, and so on, right? And so you can imagine that if you're trying to figure out, you know, what stories to promote, let's say you might notice something like, wow, this story people are reading for twice as long as most of my other stories, but it's not getting as much promotion as, as, as other stories. Maybe I should, you know, move that to a better place on my site. That's the, that's the sort of... Uh, decision making that, that people are making. Um, so now let's, let's get into the actual data. So how does data get into our system? What happens is a customer installs our JavaScript on their site, um, and then the, the JavaScript um, then on their customers, uh, in their customers' browsers, it continually sends us a stream of pings. Um, those pings come in the form of image requests, and then the URL encodes the data. Um, and so here I'm, I'm screen capping uh, in you know very official form, just screen capping my, my uh, you know Chrome inspect element. Um, uh, and what we see is basically I don't know if you guys can see, but but uh, all of these are image requests that are going out while I'm while I'm on a given page on Gizmodo. Um, and this this may or may not be be legible from where you are, but uh, but there are a bunch of fields which encode data about about my browsing session on the page. Um, I'll classify that data into sort of two, two forms. So first of all, we've got uh, what you might call page metadata or user metadata um, that's telling us stuff which is kind of static and it's about um, just the instance of browsing that we're looking at. So you know, we have a parameter uh, that encodes the host. So it says, this person's on gizmodo.com. Um, there's the path, which says, in this case, says slash, because I had the home page of, the, of Gizmodo open. Um, there's a unique user ID, which says, okay, this is this person, and it persists between pages and whatnot. Um, then we've got what I like to call measurement data. Um, so measurement data is stuff that we're actually measuring that maybe is more interesting, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of recording data about the state of the user. Um, so to throw in a few examples of that, um, this you know, first parameter, the C parameter, is telling us that when I took this screen cap, I had had the page open for 14 minutes and, and you know, 46 seconds. Um, the X parameter is telling us that the top of my screen was 208 pixels down from the top of the page. We can see the height of the page, all that. 
probably the thing that gets us most excited is, is we have a kind of fancy uh, way of counting, which I, I won't get into here, um, but w where we sort of count the amount of time that a person spend actively uh, viewing the page. So we sort of continually poll a user to ask whether they're actually, we actually think they're looking at the page. And so we, we count that up over time and encode that here. So you see a good example in this where I was spending a bunch of time taking screen caps, and so I had the page open for 14 minutes. I was engaged with the page for only a total of four seconds. So there's a huge disparity that we're, that we're able to kind of, kind of tease apart. So this data is coming in, and you know, the, the thing to note is that this data is coming in from each person on each of our customer's sites, right? So let's get into you know, what, what happens from there. So I'm gonna start off by talking about our real-time processing pipeline, which is what actually is receiving those pings. Um, so in designing a real-time pipeline, the first thing to think about is, you know, kind of what are the system requirements? Um, so first of all, um, you know, anything that's going to work for us is going to have to handle an extraordinarily high write rate um, because it's, you know, it's our customers' customers who are pinging us. So we saw 20,000 people on Gizmodo. There's one site, but there are now 20,000 people sending us pings. And if you aggregate across all of our customers, that ends up being hundreds of thousands of, of pings that are coming in every second. Um, on the other hand, the read rate is much slower because the read rate is sort of big O of customers, right? So, uh, you know, the, the people who are issuing reads are people who are paying us, you know, editors at Gizmodo or people at Charpeed or whatever, and so there's a much smaller number of those. So it's kind of an interesting data, data, database in that uh, the, the write rate and the read rate have, have a huge disparity. Um, on the other hand, we still want... Uh, the, the response to reads to be quite quick, right? So, uh, so if a person's looking at a dashboard, they want the data be, to be updating constantly. So, so even though there aren't a ton of reads, we need very low latency. Um, and for reasons that I'll get into a bit, we want to support completely arbitrary querying. So we want people to, to answer essentially any question about the real-time state of their site, um, which is, is a complicating factor. Another note which makes life a, a little bit easier is that queries are always by domain. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of embarrassingly parallel in terms of, you know, breaking things up by domain. Um, and that's because, you know, if I'm an editor at Gizmodo, I can't look at, you know, somebody else's dashboard. So, so the queries that I'm making are, are just, just for my domain. Um, so with that said, let me go in and actually sort of diagram out what our pipeline looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is probably a pretty standard kind of diagram, but what we have is, uh, is first of all, uh, JavaScript on the client side, it's sending pings. All pings are going to a, a universal endpoint, which sits behind Amazon ZLB. Um, so there's just ping.charpy.net, and all traffic comes in, whether it's coming from Gizmodo, or from charpy.com, or from gawker.com, or whoever it is. Um, and, and the ELB basically balances pings across a set of what we call fronts, which are just machines that, uh, that are, are run, running Nginx, and they're just providing a routing layer. Um, the purpose of the routing layer, layer will become clear in a second, which is that um, behind that is, is a layer which we call MemoryFly. MemoryFly is kind of the first core piece of infrastructure that we built, and, uh, and we'll talk about the details of it in a second, but you can think about it as, as for the moment, as an in-memory database which is gonna respond to the queries that, that, uh, that we need to do to, to power the dashboard. Um, and the way that MemoryFly works is it basically is, is sharded by domain. So, you know, all traffic for gawker.com goes to one, insta one instance of MemoryFly, all traffic for charpy.com goes to another instance of MemoryFly, and Nginx handles the routing to those. So Nginx just literally has a lookup table that says, okay, this is a ping, it says it's coming from gawker.com, let me send it to MemoryFly1. This is a ping that says it's for charpy.com, let me send it to MemoryFly2. Um, pings go in there, and then on the other hand, we have the same sort of lookup mapping that's happening uh, on, on the read side, so, you know, if you're on a Charpeat dashboard, um, you're hitting a generic set of API servers, and the API servers then, you know, look up the request and say, okay, this is a request for data for Gawker. Let me, you know, go to the memory fly which serves Gawker data and, and, and uh, ask for my answer. Um, so to talk about memory fly, if, you know, if that's like the, the secret sauce in the system for a second, um, memory fly, uh, is, is something that we built in-house. It's been around for a number of years um, and has predecessors with some, some stuff uh, we did with, with folks at Bitly. Um, but the, the, the key thing that it does is it's an in-memory data store and kind of in its simple, simplest form, what you can think about it being is just a thing that keeps track of a linked list of active sessions. 
right? So if you imagine, you know, if each one of those pings, if we kept track of who we thought was on the page and we had that linked list, you could run the list and compute anything you wanted. So for example, if you wanted to know, you know, how many people are there from Facebook on my homepage, you just run the list of all people who are on any page on your site, you figure out how many people are on the homepage who are also from Facebook, you sum up the number, you report it back, right? Um, that, of course, would be a terrible way to actually design something since it would be incredibly expensive every time, right? Um, so, so what we actually do is, is uh, pre-aggregate the information which we know is going to be asked for all the time. So what happens is, as a ping comes into our system, it puts itself in the list, but it also increments the counts that need to be, uh, need to be incremented. So for example, we, we, you know, if we're keeping track of the number of people who are on the home page, a ping comes in that says it's from the home page, it increments a counter that says it's on the home page. Um, then, you know, because we're getting a sequence of pings while a person is staying on the page, what happens is when subsequent pings come in, they sort of look themselves up, they realize I'm already in the linked list, they update the information they need to update, and they don't increment the counters that they don't need to increment. Um, each ping sits inside of the list and sits uh, with kind of its own timer. Um, which says, okay, after this timer goes off, I won't be considered to be on the page anymore, right? And so that's how we manage kind of active, uh, keeping track of active sessions. So I come in and I say, okay, you should expect to hear from me in the next 30 seconds. A ping comes in with, with, with that noted in the ping. And then if we don't hear from you in the next 30 seconds, we say, well, this person must have left, we didn't receive the message. And then the ping deletes itself from the linked list and also decrements all the counters that it needs to decrement. And so, it, so it's kind of this, this, you know, each ping kind of manages the state um, of, of uh, every counter that, it, that it's engaged with. Um, now, of course, there are, we, we can't pre-compute every possible thing that a person might want, and, and so, uh, what we have is basically a system where Lua is embedded um, in, inside of the database so a person can submit an arbitrary Lua script which can run the list of pings and do whatever it wants. Um, and, and so that's how, uh, that's how we're able to kind of, you know, if, if you're going to, let's say, rapidly prototype, you know, f figure out what interesting data to pull might be, you can implement the script in Lua, um, try it out, try it out a few times, uh, and then, you know, if you decide that it's something that you actually do want to keep around all the time, go back to the C code that's, that's the, you know, the native thing that it's written in and add the pre-aggregation for, for that sort of count. So, so that's how, how we kind of, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, multiplex the thing to, to allow for kind of ad hoc analysis and for, uh, for you know, production traffic. Um, as a quick note, you know, one thing that you might have wondered uh, when I had the initial diagram up is, okay, so you're putting all traffic for gawker.com on one server. What happens when you get a site that has too much traffic for one server, no matter how big it is? Um, the answer is that, that we shard amongst servers. Um, so this is used for only the very largest sites on the internet, basically. Um, but, uh, but what happens is uh, we, we essentially, you know, spin up K servers, where K is probably somewhere between, you know, 2 and 20. Um, and each one is going to handle, you know, 1 over K fraction of, of, of the traffic. And what happens is when a ping comes in, we hash its user ID. So all traffic for a given user on that host goes to a consistent shard. Um, so let's say, you know, all whatever A through F users go to this first server, all, you know, whatever, uh, G through R's go here and all S through C's go here. Um, and so now each memory fly is keeping track of a subset of data. Um, and then what happens is we have to have a separate layer, which basically uh, is kind of a MapReduce layer. So when an API request comes in, um, instead of simply hitting a, a, a single memory fly, that, that request hits this layer, which we call a combiner layer. The combiner layer kind of farms out the request to all the memory files that, are, that it needs to ask questions of and then, you know, com uh, reduces the, the results back to a single response and sends those back to the API layer. Um, and with that, like I said, we've, we've been able to scale to, uh, you know, for a given site being able to handle, you know, well over a million uh, concurrent people on the site, which is, is quite a lot to have in a linked list. Um, um, to, to give you a, a, you know, a few fancy stats about how cool we are, um, Memoryfly these days uh, handles, like I said at the beginning, uh, 
every day is hitting over 200,000 requests a second. Many days is peaking much higher than that. Um, every day it's tracking more than 9 million people on a site at once. Or sorry, you know, aggregated across all of our sites is, is, is counting more than 9 million people. And in total, the data ingress is something like a petabyte a month. Um, so it's, it handles quite a bit of data and answers questions quite quickly. Um, with that, I think, uh, and, and actually, as a, as a quick, you know, sort of demo of what it does, and this might be illegible here, um, but, uh, but the idea is, okay, let's actually see uh, Memoryfly pivoting, in, you know, on the fly. So here, if you can see it at all, we've selected, okay, I only want to look at traffic from Facebook, and all of the counts on the site are adjusted. So whereas the top number was 20,000 people on the site before, now it says 1,236. That's the number of people on the site who are just from Facebook. And every number has adjusted to keep, to keep track of that. That's all happening via you know, both a little bit of Lua and, and the sort of pre-aggregated C counts. Um, so with that, that's sort of the, the, the end of the real-time portion. Um, I thought I might stop for a second and, and see if anybody had any questions that were, that were burning before we move on. We do have a few. All right. Uh, great question. So uh, there's there's a kind of uh, complicated system where Memoryfly does its best effort to 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 dump data. So so if if Memoryfly can, it writes all of its data out to disk, and then basically what it does is it can replay uh, the the pings back through itself. So it needs to get back in a consistent state. So the second that it comes back up, the first thing that it does when it comes alive is it looks and sees if there's a dump, and if so, it loads them. Um, it's not perfect, and, and uh, an interesting artifact of bu building a real-time system, which we'll get into a little bit in a bit, is that you know the, the sort of nice thing about being, building a real-time system is, well, the numbers will be different in a minute anyway, so you know, it doesn't have to be that robust. Uh, and you know, then when you want to build a historical system on top, you wish that people hadn't made those decisions a few years ago. Um, so we have, we have a more questions. Oh, great. So since uh, we're going to try to make this as timely as possible, um, a couple of you jumped in online. Uh, someone commented that it looks like a consistent hash, um, and they cite React, like a React of Dynamo lineage, what happens when the ring grows or shrinks? Uh, great question. Um, really good question. So there are kind of um, two two things that happen depending on the site, and you know this might be overly detailed or it might be just right depending on your level of interest in our stuff. But uh, so so we have two concepts. One is what we call the general ping pool, and one is is what we call specialized ping servers. So for the largest sites. Uh, we actually need to kind of make sure that they're load balanced in correct ways. And so that means that we have specialized servers and people have said, I want Gawker on this server and it's kind of hard coded. And so when you're moving uh, from, from one server to another, you're moving to a bigger instance or whatever you're doing, uh, that really is, is, a, is a pretty manual process and we migrate pings from one machine to another, but, it, but it's a pretty manual process and it involves changing config files. Um, the short answer for, so for the general ping pool, we, we have a hash which maps things to, to servers. And the short answer is we, we don't change it a lot. I wish I had a, had a, had a fancier answer. But uh, because of that issue where suddenly everything needs to migrate servers, uh, we, or you know, a large amount of data needs to migrate, um, it's just something that happens really. So the last time, we, we keep a lot of extra capacity around. And the last time that we, uh, that we migrated was something like over, over a year ago. Um, yeah. Uh, one more. Can you tap into the eye tracking software in newer smartphones to track whether visitors are actually looking at a page? <laughs> um, I, you know, I hope that we never never reach that level of creepy. Although, you know, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so far we haven't. I mean, you know, I think to to give a you know a serious answer to maybe halfway jocular question, I, I think. Uh, you know, in the in in reality, when you're measuring stuff on the internet, there's only so accurate you can be. Even with if you had some fancy eye tracker, it doesn't necessarily know that the person is really actually reading. They might be just staring at the page. And so, what what I I I, I think you know, I use the phrase measurement deliberately in the sense that you know there's some real physical phenomenon, which is the person is looking at the page. And we have some mechanism which we think measures some statistical property, which looks like a proxy for that physical phenomenon. It's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect. No system is going to be perfect. And we, we think it's pretty good. And we've done a lot of, of uh, experiments to kind of ensure the fidelity of it. But in the end, it's, it's not going to be totally spot on. And last one, I'm using this like a chat. I blame you, Haka. I blame you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Um, all right, well, with that, let's, let's uh, jump into the historical uh, pipeline. Um, so, so like I said, you know, bolting on historical to the back of a system that wasn't engineered to be historical, uh, it c c can be an interesting challenge. Um, so uh, let me talk through a little bit of the evolution of, of how, we've, how we've done it. Um, so the first kind of V0 of historical is something that you, you when you're looking at the real-time dash, you probably didn't even think about being a historical number. But we have this graph which is showing, you know, over time the state of the real-time numbers, right? Now, MemoryFly itself being an only real-time system only knows about the people who are on the page right now, right? The second that you close the page, MemoryFly forgets about you and never knows that you were there, right? So MemoryFly can't answer questions like, draw me this graph, right? Um, and so the, the original Sharpie basically only could give you numbers about right now, which was a neat product, but you know, if you wanted to know, okay, am I trending up over time, uh, it, it couldn't answer questions like that. So it was pretty much immediately clear that we needed to build something that could give you some sort of historical data. And the simplest thing to do was to basically take snapshots. And so the solution there was just on a five minute cron, we took a snapshot of every aggregate that was inside of the database, right? Um, it's a lot of aggregates, um, but it's not that many aggregates, right? So, so it's, it's on the order of, you know, low terabytes per month um, because there are these aggregate counts and not, you know, every individual session. Um, so le that lets you do something like draw this graph, right? So you can say, okay, well, what was that, two, you know, this graph is saying this point right here is the 2,520, and you can ask, okay, what was that number five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, and so on. And so that's a solution which works for powering this product, right? Um, but the second you try to actually do anything cool on top of that, you realize that it's wholly inadequate to do almost anything, right? Because it's a system that's snapshotted metric, it, it's sort of pre-snapshotted metrics, right? And you can try to add metrics to it, but in the end, there's only so much that you can add to be snapshotted. And what you want to be able to do is ask questions. I think the most interesting sort of questions for us to ask when you're analyzing traffic are not about, uh, you know, kind of the shape of pages over time, but rather, rather the shape of users over time. Right, uh, and and you to do that, you really need to be kind of you know taking user by user pictures rather than rather than sort of you know page by page or site site by site pictures. So so we realized eventually that we really needed to make a real kind of historical data store that stored you know a record for every session, um, and so that's kind of you know what what maybe we'll call v1. Um, so, uh, you know, to go into requirements again to make the system work. So we're going to have one record for every single page view that occurs. Um, so that means that there are going to be billions of records per day. Um, it's also in the spirit of what has worked well for us in MemoryFly. Um, we also want a system that can both answer ad hoc queries so that we can do quick development, so that we can try out building various models, so that we can look at numbers, so that when a press inquiry comes in, we can pull some quick stat for them. And we also uh, want to be able to use the same system uh, to actually power production. Um, and so it both needs to be low latency enough that, that you know, it's nice to use as a human and high throughput enough that, that it can actually uh, do useful things for, for, for production. Um, so to get into the actual uh, setup of, of the kind of data pipeline, um, this, is, this is my simple stake diagram, which, which is basically, okay, so we're bolting something onto the back of the real-time system, and I'll talk about that something in a minute. Um, but there are these couple of stages. So first of all, there's this process that I'll call sessionization, which is smashing together pings. So we've got a bunch of pings that all represent data about a single uh, page view, and we want to end up with one record, not a thousand records if I stayed on the page long enough to, to ping a thousand times. Second of all, we need to actually transform it in some way that it can be loaded into a data warehouse. Then we load it into a data warehouse. We use Amazon Redshift, and I'll talk a little bit about you know, kind of why, why we chose that. Uh, and then we need to do some post-processing once it's loaded, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. And then, of course, finally, there's actually using the whole thing uh, later. Um, but let's talk about the pipeline first. Um, so uh, to, to jump in with sessionization. So like I said, you know, the issue is we've got a large number of pings that each contain sort of incremental data about a session. So I send a ping that says, I've been on the page for zero seconds. I send a ping, you know, a minute later that says, I've been on the page for a minute. And, you know, and, and people keep pages, you know, I probably have 20 pages open on my computer right now, 
And for every one of those pages that has Chartbeat running, um, they're continually sending pings even during the course of this talk. So, so you end up with a lot of pings per page view. And a there's, there's a lot of extraneous data in there. So the first thing that we want to do is smash those together into one record. Um, we've tried a ton of approaches for this. Um, so to, to, to name a few, the first thing that we did is we started with data, and we captured data at the routing layer. So um, essentially what happened is, is as the data comes into Nginx, Nginx can dupe uh, a ping to another location. So it sends, it sends the data into the memory fly it's sending it to. And then Nginx also dupes it to a local process, which writes the data to disk that's shipped to S3 and, and goes on its way. Um, but uh, but so, so there, the data that's being recorded is ping by ping. And then we did some sort of offline process to sessionize those, to smash them together. We've tried a bunch of these. The first thing that we did that we knew wouldn't scale, but we thought, hey, we might as well try it for sort of R&D, is we just, we did upserts into a local database, right? So we were running Mongo, and we had a record per user, or per page view. And just as another ping comes in, it upserts itself into that, into that database. Anybody who's messed around with Mongo knows immediately that that will not work. Right, um, um, you know, it it worked at at small scale with with you know thousands of records, but if you're gonna try to write hundreds of thousands of records uh, a second, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so we started off with that. Um, we've tried a million other approaches where we took these pings, we loaded them into SQL and tried to smash them with SQL. We try, we've, and we're still doing a bunch of work on pumping them through EMR and and smashing them with EMR. Um, and you know all of these approaches sort of I think run into the same problem, which is that when data is ordered on time, it's actually you know kind of a pain to do this, right? Uh, you know, in the end, you know you're watching a person, you start watching them at some period of time, and then two hours later they send a ping, and so in order to smash their whole session together, you need to look at a huge window of data, and so you know if you're if you imagine doing this in something like EMR, you just have to look at a very large window of time in order to to smash things for a given period of time together, and that ends up just being quite expensive in terms of of moving data around. Um, so another approach which we've taken, which has been really successful, is we realize, like, hey, Memoryfly is keeping track of these things and doing this sessioning, right? So when a ping comes in, like I mentioned, uh, Memoryfly says, you know, okay, was this ping, was this session already seen? If so, update my, my record for that session. Uh, if not, then create a new session. And then eventually, Memoryfly, when it thinks you're not on the page anymore, it deletes you out and goes on its merry way. So the, the thing that we, we realized is, well, when Memoryfly is deleting you out, it doesn't just have to delete you and decrement you from your accounts. It also can write you to disk and ship that to S3, right? Um, and adding that, uh, adding that step to the, to the process, um, I think it was, was pretty huge in terms of simplifying stuff. So I think maybe the, the lesson there is, you know, if you've already got something sort of listening on the stream, you, you may as well use it. Um, and, and doing that smashing in, in that stage just helps immeasurably in terms of, in terms of data processing. Um, so, and, and just to note in there, this is just an example of what I mentioned earlier. So every ping sort of ships with this timer. So this ping, um, says, you know, if you don't hear from me, it has a 45 uh, in this record, which says if you don't hear from me in 45 seconds, consider me gone. Pings have a, depending on how frequently they're being sent, that parameter changes, but basically every ping send, ships with something that says you can delete me after this, kind of a TTL. And so we, we take advantage of that to, to, to do the sessioning. Um, so from there, um, we have uh, an ETL process. It's not the most exciting thing. I don't, I don't know if it could be. So basically, we have to do three things. Um, we have to transform it to CSV. Redshift reads CSVs, so you just have to, you know, take what was just a URL, and, you know, from an image request, turn it into a CSV. We have to do a bunch of valid validation and sanitization. So you know, it's the internet. Sometimes URLs come in malformed. Sometimes they have incoherent values. Um, you want to avoid losing as much data as you possibly can. So you recover what you can. You know, if a field is non-essential and malformed, you just you know empty it out. Um, and uh, if something is really malformed in a way that it can't be loaded into the database, then you drop it. 
Um, and, and finally, we, we uh, attach a bunch of new metadata. Uh, so maybe the two interesting examples are we do a bunch of user agent classification. Um, so you know you might when a pin comes in it has a, has a UA string which tells you what sort of browser it came from. So the two important things are one sort of obviously on the traffic side we care about classifying desktop traffic versus mobile traffic versus tablet traffic, you know Windows versus iOS, all all that sort of stuff. So that happens uh, based on the UA, and and then the other thing that we do is we flag things as as whether or not they're coming from from bots or from from things that look human. Of course, that doesn't get you every bot, but some things like Googlebot want to be found, right? So they come in with a UA that identifies themselves as that, and it, it you know makes a measurable difference on on traffic. So all of that stuff happens uh, in in the in the transform stage. Um, then uh, that data is loaded up uh, into Redshift um, to walk you through for a second what Redshift sort of buys you. Um, it's uh, it's basically just a big Amazon managed Postgres system. Uh, it doesn't do everything that Postgres does. It does a little bit of stuff that Postgres doesn't do. Um, but, uh, but it pretty much is just SQL, um, which I didn't think I would ever uh, spend my time writing. And now I spend a lot of time writing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it speaks SQL. You know, it's fast. It scales well. You can resize clusters, all that. Um, it's column oriented, so you know it handles aggregations well and it handles compression really well. Um, importantly for us, uh, it does batch imports from S3 well and quickly, um, and so we can import. You know, it essentially. Uh, you know, scales to any amount of data that we've wanted to throw in it, and that, that's, that's really been, been its essential property. We experimented with a ton of different databases uh, trying to see uh, what would be the right thing. You know, we tried things like Cassandra. Um, Redshift just did what we wanted better. Um, so to talk through, you know, I, I think this is probably fairly specific to, to Redshift, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it. But we've learned some important lessons, which I imagine some people in this room are going to use it. So some things that are important that we've that we've have come out of Redshift. So first of all, um, joins are the worst uh, in in SQL and and especially in Redshift. And you basically, you know, if you want something to be performant, you can't use them, right? Um, and so. Uh, the the price of that is duplicating data. So you know I have three examples where basically a ping, you know there are three. Let's say you have fields that you have to denormalize, or you'd have to store in some star structure, and we denormalize in every possible case, uh, so that so that we can uh, avoid joining. Um, I don't I don't think I can give uh, a clock on what the speed up for that was, but it's of the order of you know we felt like we couldn't use Redshift, and then when we started denormalizing tables, we felt like we could use Redshift. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a game changer in that sense. Um, second of all, you know sometimes you have things where you have to join. You have infrequent queries that you run that just needed to be joined, um, and the important thing here, which is a, a fairly recent thing that I think we've really uh, come to understand. Um, is that so? There's this notion of a distribution key, uh, which is basically, you know, your your uh, your data is sharded across an, a number of of what they call slices, which are essentially a disk with a CPU attached to it, and and a distribution key decides for each row which slice it lives on, um, and you can you apply a distribution key to each table. So if you apply the same distribution key to two tables, it guarantees that any two things that have the same key, you know, key. Are going to end up on the same disk, um, and if you're joining and you can avoid network, it's a huge win. So uh, changing our table structure so that we used uh, the most common uh, key that we joined on as our distribution key gave us something like a, a 5x speed up on joins and a 10x speed up on on grouping on that on that key, which is obviously a huge win. Um, the final note is there's also this parameter called a sort key, which decides, you know, given all of the data that's lying on a specific disk for a specific table, how is it physically sorted on disk? Um, and again, um, you know, you get huge speed ups from sort of using this correctly. Um, so almost all of our queries, as you might imagine, are kind of windowed on time. So we're asking, you know, how many X's happened yesterday? How many X's happened over the last month? And uh, because of that, you know, if if you're sorting the data on disk in terms of time, you just avoid having to look at you know 99% of the data, and you get pretty much a linear speed up in terms of that. So if you're looking at half the data, it runs twice as fast. A tenth of the data, it runs ten times as fast. And so we found, you know, somewhere depending on the range of the data, somewhere between a 10 and a 100x speed up between the two. 
Um, so in combination, you know, we're talking about between uh, those three insights getting, I, I would say, three orders of magnitude of speed up. Um, which, you know, obviously three orders of magnitude is great, I, but, but I think, you know, really, like, I can't stress enough if you use it how much you need to do this, right? We went from a system that was, you know, d essentially didn't work, right? That where, where we just said, when we first loaded, loaded data up in, into this cluster, we, we felt like we didn't get anything out of it at all. And now it's a, able to, to power, uh, you know, tens of thousands of queries running nightly against it. Be, you know, multiple data scientists and data engineers and backend engineers running queries against it, uh, you know, throughout the day, and, and it, it's able to keep up. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been great, but only with a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of unpleasantness in the meantime. Um, so finally, one other thing that I think is kind of an interesting lesson on top of this is, uh, is, is our post-import processing. So there's some stuff that you need to do if you're going to take in traffic data. Um, Two things that are really important that I'm giving as examples of this are you need to deduplicate and you need to do some fancy robot detection. Um, so deduplicating, you know, try as you might, you're going to end up with, you know, for some reason somebody's pinging and then four hours later some phantom ping comes in for the same session and your sessionization was insufficient to get it, right? Um, we've done a lot of work at uh, at trying to push this to the sessionization side. So messing around with, with what we could do on the, on the you know, ingestion side to get rid of duplicates. But no matter what we did, we basically were ending up with something, depending on the domain, between 5 and 10% duplicate rows, um, which is totally unacceptable if you're giving people accurate numbers, especially we do a lot of stuff tracking ads. And with ads, since it's directly attached to commerce, you have to be right. Um, and, uh, and, and so you need to deduplicate. And eventually we sort of realized, well, deduplicating on the, uh, on the sessionization side is quite hard, but deduplicating in SQL is just this query, right? Uh, it's really easy. Uh, and it runs in a couple of seconds for even a very large table. Um, so, uh, so we sort of you know, switched, switched to that. And, and it basically allowed us to, to simplify our, our, uh, our sessionization and, and ETL process quite a bit. Another example of that is uh, this graph on the right with no axes on it, um, which, it, which is, is basically, uh, like I said, we need to do some, some fancy robot detection. So, so we detect robotic uh, pings from looking at their user agent, but you can imagine that there's web traffic out there that doesn't want you to know that it's robotic, but is. Um, and there's a whole world of people out there whose whole job it is to, to detect traffic like this. I won't claim that we are as good as they at it, but we, we do as, as best we can. And so you know, th what this graph is showing us is just w one example of how we do this. So this is kind of, in, in an overly fancy way, basically taking a Fourier transform of, of how frequently people are visiting the pages and looking for spikes. Um, so you know, we can see, for instance, this thing is, is for a given period, we're seeing a, a, the, you'd, you'd expect these lines to be flat if there were no kind of periodic page and visit, periodic pattern in visiting pages. These funny spiky things are things that are oddly regular uh, visits to a site. Um, and so if you see something like that, you might suspect that it's a robotic uh, user or something running on a cron or whatever it is, and you might want to flag that as suspicious uh, and, and hold it out. Um, and again, uh, doing that on the ingestion side, I, I have no idea really how you would accomplish it, right? Because you need to be able to look at historical data. And we thought about, you know, okay, do we somehow, you know, keep some lookup table which is storing suspicious stuff, and then as pings come in, you look them up in the lookup table? That just seems really complicated when you're talking about, you know, billions and billions of records. Um, but again, you know, generating this sort of stuff, you know, on the SQL side is actually quite easy. And so, you know, pulling it to doing one SQL query. Uh, ended up being a big win over trying to, trying to make a very complicated ETL pipeline. Um, so I think that's all I've got on, on the ETL side. Um, with uh, the time I've got left, I wanted to talk about you know, one kind of neat application of, of, this, of this. Actually, uh, before I do that, any questions? Oh, great. So I think you just ha handled the bad data one, right? Someone asked, have you ever had uh, someone attack memory fly with fake data? Uh, no, not at least not that we know of. So, so we do the best job that we can to, to detect. Um, as far as you, we, we, we've had bad actors, but not in the sense of, of attackers. We've had bad actors like, 
you know, a site that does something crazy, you know, puts five pingers on a page that are all pinging us at once or something like that, but, but we haven't ha had to handle truly malicious people. How do you decide on a TTL for a session? Uh, great question. So, so it's basically, uh, so pings, uh, which is determined by the, you know, mostly what we care about when we're measuring the time they're spending. So if you're sitting, 99% of people are doing on any given web page, you don't really have to do anything. And so if a person's idle, we send very infrequent pings. If a person is, is making activity, uh, we send much more frequent pings. Um, so the TTL is just a formula on top of that. So it's some multiple of, you know, the ping frequency plus a little bit of a constant in case something gets hung up. Uh, it basically lets us drop one ping and then have there be a little bit of jitter in the network. Memoryfly seems to have evolved, evolved in a pre-Redis world. <laughs> if you could do it over now, how do you feel about Redis? Um, you know, I guess I personally don't have enough experience with Redis to have a, a substantially informed opinion. Uh, but I will say that, you know, I think like most architectures, uh, we would not have done it the same way if we were doing it now. Um, it, it was, there was no great in-memory data store five and a half years ago. And so it was rolled by hand. And yeah, it probably wouldn't be in a world where you have Redis, in a world where you could be doing a lot of this stuff in something like Storm, we, we probably would have done it. And that, that stuff, we're sort of actively researching whether or not we should be, we should be thinking about, about pipelines like that. And this is a specific question on the ETL stuff. Um, how do you see Vertica and BigQuery compared to Red, Redshift to query billions of records? Uh, great question. You know, I, I haven't... I think Vertica is, is, Vertica we haven't touched. BigQuery I think is interesting. Um, so I guess I don't, I, you know, I don't have an extremely informed opinion. I think they're all interesting. They're all, you know, you might, I, I guess I would, I, there's no point in, in speculating based on, on conversations that, that I've had with folks, but you might get better performance out of them. I think that, you know, for, for us, the performance that we've gotten out of Redshift has been sufficient. And in order to get, a, to have Redshift do a different thing for us, we'd probably need another two orders of magnitude reduction in speed, which I don't imagine anything would give us. So uh, to me, the kind of phase change would happen, and this is something we'll talk about on the reporting side. Right now, um, our, our, uh, our use of Redshift for powering production is basically, you know, it, it, it's built around the fact that Redshift queries are fast, but not quite fast enough to really power a dashboard. So you have queries that might take half a second, you have queries that might take 20 seconds, you have big queries that might take five minutes. Um, and, uh, and we don't even want to make people wait five seconds, right? Um, and so what we do is basically, in every case that we can, much like those memory fly pre-computed uh, counts, in every case that we can, we at night enumerate all queries that we definitely know we want the results of, run them and cache the results and serve the results out of cache. Um, if, re if Redshift were two orders of magnitude faster, we might be able to, to query it directly from the dash. Um, it's not designed to do that. It has concurrency limits and whatnot, so I don't know that we would anyway. But, but you know, if it were 5x faster, it would be great, but it, it wouldn't, wouldn't change what it can do. All right. Um, so, yeah, let me, uh, you know, take the last couple of minutes to, to talk about some, some uh, historical reporting stuff that we're doing. Um, so, uh, one of the coolest things that I think, you know, has come out of my team in the last few months is uh, is this stuff that basically takes a bunch of you know all of this quantitative data that's in Redshift and spits out these actual human readable reports, which you all sitting back there probably can't read a word of, but trust me, they're really cool. Um, uh, and so so basically the idea is, is so this is part of a product that we have for advertising. The basic use case of this thing is. Um, there are, you know, people in the world whose job it is to go out and say, you should advertise on, you know, chirpy.com because our site is so good. These are the following cool things about it. People on social media love us, whatever, whatever, right? And those people, you know, often are really sort of talking on gut, right? So, you know, you're saying, 
well, you know what you know, Terpede traffic would be like. It's the best, right? People are so smart and so high income and whatever, right? Um, but the interesting thing is that because we're really measuring you know, every, everything about how people are consuming the site, we can spit out some pretty interesting insights about how, how people consume and sort of play those back to a person who can then talk about the site. So what this thing is doing is actually spitting out uh, you know, paragraphs of text uh, that, that we think are good ways to, to describe the site, along with a bunch of sort of supporting facts so for, for folks who can't read, uh, this sentence says, uh, when it comes to the amount of time people spend reading content, you know, x.com generally outperforms the internet. Our readers spend 59 seconds per article, which is more than 3x our competition. Your campaign, we're talking about an ad campaign, uh, ran equally across the site and was therefore able to take advantage of all of our content, blah, 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 right? Um, and then we have a bunch, you know, we have these supporting facts. So, for example, people from Facebook.com uh, spent 55,737 seconds looking at ads from this campaign, right? Um, so, so there are these sorts of, of features that are, uh, fit or, that are spit out as well. Um, so I'm going to talk through uh, how this stuff gets generated. Um, it's probably less cool than you think it is, although it's still pretty cool. Um, uh, so, uh, so first of all, is a, I wanted to make a quick point, which I, I made earlier, but it's this notion that we, you know all of this stuff is kind of run offline. We pre-compute what we can. Um, we so we have async workers. They cache the results in Mongo. Those the Mongos are what are actually serving our, our APIs to the dash. So that's the sort of architecture of everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, so in general, uh, the the first approach that we tried is basically uh, you enumerate a bunch of things that might be interesting to say about a site, right? Maybe the site has great traffic from some referrer. Maybe a site, you know, has terrible traffic versus the internet. You enumerate, you know, a, a ton of things that might be true, and you enumerate them in a way that, that we call, like, a Mad Lib, right? So, uh, you know, my example here that's simple is X of your top stories received significant traffic from social sources, right? Okay, so that's a Mad Lib. A human wrote that sentence, right? Um, so you write that sentence down, and then, uh, so that's some fact, and we'll call that fact foo, right? Then you write two other things. First of all, you write, you write a function which fills in the Mad Lib. We'll call that the data function, right? And so that's a function where, okay, so if this sentence is X of our top stories received social traffic, uh, we need to actually grab the X, right? So you write something which, given access to some set of data, can compute that X, right? Then you write uh, what I'm calling a relevance function, which is some, you know, a detector that decides whether or not foo would be a smart thing to say, right? So, for example, if zero of your top stories receive traffic from social stories, you probably don't want to say that as the intro to, you know, to your story about your site, right? If 10 of them did, then it's probably good, right? Um, and so, so you can kind of, you know, enumerate a ton of, thing, of things of these form where you have a sentence, a data function, a relevance function, uh, and then basically run through them. And so in V1 of this process, what we did is basically uh, enumerate a ton of them and then just run them all, right? So start with the first one, run, it, run its relevance function. If relevance function says true, run data function. If, you know, throw data function into the sentence, store it, right? Uh, and run them all, right? Now, of course, that's extraordinarily inefficient. You know, if you have a thousand uh, sentences, you have to run a thousand relevance functions and maybe a thousand data functions, that gets expensive. Um, it's also, you know, if you're sort of doing that, it's pretty hard to share, you know, what might be shared state between, between the relevance functions. You can cache, but beyond that, you know, it, it's, it, you don't have any coherent state. Um, that also sort of trickles down to, to what sort of narratives you spit out. Um, so, so doing an architecture like that, you can kind of spit out sentences like this. So these sentences on the right, this campaign was featured in the opinion section, right? You can spit out a sentence like that. You can't spit out a paragraph like we have on the left because you don't really detect any structure between, between the queries, right? Um, so for both of those reasons, we decided to go down this, this complicated route of, of something that's a little bit better, which is basically um, structuring, structuring uh, facts into a decision tree um, and then kind of walking the decision tree. So this is just an example of a tree that you might use, and we apply a number of trees and sort of walk all the things that are relevant. So the example here is, okay, so if we're trying to decide what you know, smart things to say, say about a site, the first question you might ask in this sort of structure is say, okay, does the site actually have high engagement compared to other sites on the internet? If no, we're not gonna talk about you know, anything related to engagement. 
We're going to talk about other things, right? If yes, we'll say something about whether the site has high engagement, um, and then we, you know, we ask a series of questions trying to trying to define, uh, you know, which kind of branches to search on, right? Um, that search then kind of inherently implies uh, the paragraph structure. Right? So you can actually think, we, you, you can imagine you know, walking this tree and seeing the results. So here if we say, you know, according to this red line, this is a site that has high engagement for the internet. Uh, this was a targeted, this was a non-targeted non campaign. Uh, it was saturated across the, across the site. So you might write a sentence that says, your site is super engaging. And uh, although this campaign wasn't targeted, it reached almost everybody in your audience. Right? Um, and so, so walking the tree implies a narrative structure, which you can sort of, by filling in the Mad Libs along each way, you can end up with, with, with a coherent sentence. Then when you reach the bottom, you have some pool of facts which you can compute results on and then, and then kind of uh, fill, fill those in to end up with, with all those uh, takeaways to the right. And you can run this for a bunch of trees uh, and uh, and end up with with a bunch of stories that are that are all kind of you know nicely structured. Um, so I think with that, that's pretty much uh, what I've got. Let me run through a little bit of, of future work and then take uh, take some final questions. But um, so in terms of stuff that we definitely you know are are actively exploring amongst a million other things. So first of all. Um, a lot of the counting that we're, you know, what I'd like to do is move our use of things like Redshift to be as sophisticated as possible and not use Redshift for stuff that we don't have to use it for. It can only handle so many queries and stuff that doesn't need to hit it shouldn't, right? Um, so something like the, those fancy robot detection things really does need Redshift because you need to be able to, to do queries that are across time um, in, in complicated ways. But something like, you know, Counting how many you know page views a individual article has gotten across the last month does not need anything historical, right? You can listen on the stream and do that count. Um, you know, with you know probabilistic data structures like hyperlog logs and count sketches, you can count uh, you know pretty accurately things like you know unique visitors or frequency and things like that. And so, something that I like to do is move all of our you know straight up counting out of uh, Redshift whenever possible and, and, and move it to just counting directly on the stream. Um, another thing which uh, I'll use as a plug for our CTO's talk this weekend at PyGotham uh, is the use of, of foreign data wrappers, which are pretty much the coolest thing. Um, a foreign data wrapper uh, in a sentence is something which basically allows Postgres to interface with some data store, whatever it is, right? Uh, so you write, you know, in our case, most of our code base is in Python, so you write a Python function which just supplies an interface to Postgres. And so, for instance, uh, you know, you could have, let's say, you know, we have, I don't know, I'll spitball an example. We have something like data coming in from, from GNIP that's just raw tweets, and we don't want to load them into Redshift, but we want Redshift to be able to talk to, the, to that data store anyway. Uh, by, by sort of wrapping that, that stream inside of a foreign data wrapper, you can put queries against it. They're really fun um, and pretty easy to use. Um, another uh, thing which I want to do is, is sort of uh, take that uh, language generation stuff stuff one level deeper. So right now we're sort of parsing facts into trees and then using trees to you know to, to sort of uh, project back down into paragraphs. Um, instead, what I'd like to do is really start with lower level facts. So you can imagine little kind of atomic facts like just a single number or a single you know pick up of a referrer onto something and sort of parsing those into sentences and just basically doing doing one one more level on top of that which I think you know one of the interesting challenges is that with any sort of automatically generated text you you, you need as much variety as possible and so getting as close to the data as possible I think there's just a lot of variety in data so getting down there might might get us to that um, so with that I, I should say that you know we're pretty much always hiring um, you should go to chirpy.com slash jobs or email me or whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for listening and love to hear questions. All right, last chance to get your questions in. If you missed the site before, it's hakkalabs.co. All right, so here's one that we didn't ask before. Can custom queries be done by users or only by chartbeat developers? 
If so, how do you sandbox C++ code to avoid <laughs> users reading info from other people's domains? Oh, great question. Um, so in general, most custom queries can only be done by Chartbeat, but there is some, so I guess there are kind of two versions of custom queries. So there, there are parts of the dashboard which are not implemented in this, in this C++ code, which require sort of that Lua interface to get the results. Then you have true custom queries. True custom queries on the real time are only runnable by Chartbeat employees. Um, but it still raises an interesting question, which is we'd like to be able to write our own custom queries and be in a sandboxed environment um, so that we don't, let's say, write a query which takes so long that it breaks the actual production uh, memory fly. Um, we have a dev environment, but sometimes you actually need production traffic. And so, so uh, there's actually a, a really nice uh, kind of wrapper on this where um, you get, when you're write, running the Lua code, you get this sandbox environment. So for instance, if your Lua code manages to segfault itself, it doesn't crash memory fly, it just crashes itself. Um, so it really is an isolated environment. Um, and as far as different hosts, the different hosts are really segmented onto different processes. So you, you don't have to worry so much about sort of security concerns. It's more about performance concerns. Who do we have? How long do you keep full resolution of data? Do you batch aggregate roll-ups on some rolling frame? Seven days, one minute resolution for eight to 30 days, hour resolution for one month plus. Like we keep full resolution data forever right now. Uh, yeah, that's the short answer. Cool. Anyone else? Last chance. Yeah. Into our user ID. Uh, good question. So our uh, our user ID is stored on a on a first party cookie, um, which means that it doesn't track people between sites. It's only tracking people on a specific site. Um, there's actually a really interesting. Uh, it, it, we could probably spend a whole talk on it. Um, there's a funny problem, which is that so for reasons that are probably mostly legacy reasons. We generate the user ID on the client side. It's not a UUID, which is served from the server. Um, there's an interesting problem, which is that uh, you know, when this code was first written, you know, Chirpy was a small company. And so the way that the user ID was generated was 16 consecutive calls to RAND. Um, and the problem with that is that if you don't have a lot of entropy in the browser, you end up with not that much entropy in your user ID. Um, and the, the entropy in your user ID basically is something like 32 bits if you're on a 32-bit system, right? Now, uh, you end up with collision. So if you're, if you're trying to hash, you know, uh, if you have 32 bits of hash space and you're trying to, uh, and, and you're trying to hash, sorry, if you have something like 64 bits of hash space and you're trying to handle hash 32 bits of, two, of things, two to the 32 things, you start being worried about collisions. So uh, with 32 bits of entropy, we could only handle uh, two to the six. So, yeah, yeah, am I right? Yeah, two to the six. No, I'm backwards. Two to the 16 things uh, without being worried about collisions, which is not a lot of things, right? Um, so we had to. We basically had to get very worried uh, about collisions. And what we end up doing is just juicing every possible piece of entropy we can get. So uh, we. Rather than making calls to RAND, we make a call to RAND, we look at the width of the browser, the height of the browser, the path the person is on, uh, the, you know, if we can get access to what extensions are installed. You know, every possible thing that we do to just make a big string that has as much entropy as possible in it. Um, our back of the envelope is that that thing has something like 84 bits of entropy, which means that we can handle around two to the 42 things without collisions, which is not that many. I mean, that's a lot. It's For user IDs, it's enough. There are not two to the 42 users, right? Um, but for sessions, there might be two to the 42 sessions, and we have a session ID also. So it's kind of pushing it. It's the best that we can do on the client side. But you know, the number of collisions is, is as far as we know. So. It's it, doing that completely solved the user user ID collision thing uh, and, and also solved the session ID thing, but it's it's like a back of the mind concern for later. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs>So we have a, a bunch of interesting meetups coming up um, as soon as everybody gets back from your summer Labor Day break. Uh, talk to us if, you're, if your company wants to present something interesting. This was an awesome talk. Uh, if you have something equally awesome or even slightly less awesome, we might consider it. This is a high bar. 
Uh, but find me or Julia or one of the hacker folks in the back. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs>